Chapter 9, Social Networking, Part 2 of 3, Privacy and Business Use of Social Networks. The learning outcomes include, summarize how social networks operate, show how people use social networks personally and in the business world, Assess key ethical challenges associated with the use of social networking. We have privacy while we're looking around on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram, right? All of these social networks ask us to create a user profile, including your name, pictures, relationship status, gender identity, religion, location, family information, high school, college, work history, favorite movies, favorite series, favorite quotations, favorite books, games, groups, and on and on. Think about how much LinkedIn and Facebook know about you. We tell them everything. But we only tell them all of our information after carefully reading the terms of use policies for each. The terms include the, pri the privacy you will have when using the social network and how and for what purposes the owner of the app can use your information, the information you provide. You may change your privacy settings, which gives you some control, but did you know that all of the default settings return? Every time you update an app, be sure to go back and review your privacy settings. The app won't warn you of a return to default settings. Assume when you post a picture or make a comment or tweet or a snap, assume that others will look at it. Assume it will be on the top of Google searches. How do you feel about it now? Your technology is not secure. There are ways you can make your communications more secure, and the best way is to limit the amount of data you give to others. You can take a look at this YouTube video on the future of internet privacy. The U.S. Air Force has weighed in on social media privacy as seen in this picture. While they consider all personal accounts as being personal, you are still liable for what you post. When you're talking with officers and enlisted personnel, you must use appropriate communication and conduct. Don't post defamatory, vulgar, obscene, threatening, hateful, or other offensive or illegal material. Do not infringe on intellectual property or on the personal privacy of others. So basically, your personal accounts are not personal. Even when online, even when offline, officers and enlisted personnel should not post hastily. You have freedom of speech, but the Air Force has conduct guidelines that you must follow at all times. Say what you want, but understand that what you post is not private. Two hundred and four million email messages, eighty three thousand dollars in sales, three thousand pictures, and twenty million views of photos, over two million Google searches. 30 hours of video uploaded to YouTube, almost 640,000 gigabytes of data transferred. How much privacy do you have with all of this information? Virtually none. If you think that what you say in a work meeting will be private, ask the police officers who were videotaped without their knowledge. Ask the advisor at KSU who was videotaped getting into a fight with a student. Assume that you're being watched at all times and go on with life. We do the best we can, but we have little privacy nowadays. Even going out on the streets of New York City, there are monitoring cameras everywhere. London has more cameras than any other city. Google Earth is mapping our entire world, and they may catch you sunbathing in the nude in your backyard. They do remove any inappropriate pictures upon request. We have access to a limitless amount of information, but with that access comes a loss of privacy. You need to try to keep private that which is private, but even the definition of privacy has to change with the times. If you post something on Facebook, let's say your profile picture, 
and you allow everything to search for and find that picture, then don't get mad when the local law enforcement officers use your profile picture and say that you have a warrant out for your arrest. This really happened to one of my former students who is a police officer. A lot of people said he shouldn't post her picture, but hey, she put it on Facebook and he could search with the Facebook profile page of the local law enforcement. In spite of the outcry, the woman showed up at the station the next morning with her lawyer. It was a minor offense and she was released the same day. The moral of the story is that we have very little privacy. Don't share and don't be stupid. Protect your data. Even if you guard your personal information and make sure that others don't have access to pictures and videos until they are friends or, or friends of friends or whatever group you want to allow, the social media app itself may share with others, and you likely agree to allow them to do so. Further, some social media apps have agreed to help law enforcement combat terrorism or ban accounts that threaten the safety of the U.S. What you post may be shared with law enforcement agencies, the press, and the public, depending on what you agree to in the terms of service. You know, the one we all read, right? Data breaches occur even when privacy protections are strong. Email addresses may be stolen and then spoofed to make it look like it's coming from your address, which your contacts recognize. Malware can go farther with keystroke loggers or other methods of determining your passwords. By the way, passwords are very insecure. If possible, for the utmost security, use a strong password and two-step authentication. You receive a code via text message, for instance, after logging in. That makes it more secure, but it's a pain for most of us who are used to instantly getting logged in. You have to balance security with ease of use and weigh the risk and potential loss of data. If it's your Facebook account, perhaps it's not as necessary to have strong security. If you're working on virus modification at the CDC, however, you're going to want to use more than a single user ID and password. I don't know what they use at the CDC, but I hope it's two or three steps, including biometrics and a strong password and multiple factor authentication. We know the personal applications of social media, even if we choose not to use some of the apps. Social media presents a new way to reach customers. You get to describe the new products you offer or the new services you can provide. You can feature the products and promote them, or you can gather customer feedback and decide if you want to introduce a product. Whatever you do, you want to be able to talk to your customers quickly, securely, and personally. You're not just selling your product or service, you are connecting with an engaged potential customer. This customer reads reviews and perhaps even writes reviews. They expect you to send them specials tailored to their personal interest. When I log into Amazon, for instance, I don't see hunting gear promoted since I don't happen to hunt, but I will see books advertised and shoes and dog toys and cranberry juice. Amazon knows me and they know what I need and when I need it. I appreciate the personal touch. I know they're just trying to sell products, but they help me remember what I need. Kroger does the same, sending targeted digital and paper coupons that match the items I buy every week. They know me and they engage with me personally. We expect that now, and with the advent of big data, companies are now able to better use small data and personalize my experience and yours. The targeted advertising that Kroger and Amazon use with me generates a conversation. I may talk about it with my students or colleagues, like I'm doing now. Do you use Kindle Unlimited, for instance, which allows access to hundreds of thousands of books for free after you pay $9.99 a month? I actually got a deal on it that on Amazon's Summer Black Friday event. I was able to get two years of Unlimited for almost half price. With that, they charge me the entire amount up front, and whether or not I continue my current reading patterns, they have their money. Meanwhile, I can read all of the lesser-known books for free, as well as some recent new releases. 
It's worth it to me because I read a lot, and I have an eclectic mix of genres that I like to choose from. Amazon knows that I have multiple Kindle apps installed and that I read a lot. Their targeted advertising reaches me and others like me. That's back to the big data. They are able to group people into personalized groups of big data. There are a lot of people with similar buying patterns as me, and Amazon knows us. They connect with us. They engage with us, and they seem to be doing okay so far. Companies can use technology in multiple ways to get the word out about their products. One way is direct advertising with sponsored or promotional ads or on various social media websites. If I buy oatmeal cookies on Amazon, Google is going to pick up on that and show me some other things I might like. Rather than running banner ads targeted to everyone, they use banner ads targeted to people like me. Big data identifies us and direct advertising strategies find us. It's good for me too, however. I don't get a lot of ads for travel or cheerleading or other things that I'm not interested in. Social media sites may also use my network of friends. They know me and often my friends are similar in socioeconomics and, and any other groups. I like to call them tribes that we belong to. I'm a woman, so that's a group of mine. I'm also middle-aged. Yes, I'm going to live to be 150 years old. Be quiet. So that's a group of mine. I'm a parent of teenage boys. I'm a fan of the Braves. I like to shop online at Amazon and Zulily. I have dogs. Think of all the groups or tribes that you belong to. You and I are in a group right now, a classroom setting. In some classes, you have groups, which is also one of your tribes. You see how we overlap in some areas, but not others? That's how direct advertising works. They know me, and they try to indirectly reach others with similar interest. They want my network to become interested and market new products or increase brand awareness. Somehow, sometimes, however, they reach a group that doesn't work. Maybe I attended a libertarian meeting by mistake last week, thinking it was a city council voting on a new zoning ordinance. I may have little in common with this new tribe I accidentally joined. Or my friends may be older or younger or richer or poorer. Big data and personalizing my interest helps the consumer and the seller. You can see in the picture here how every department can use social media effectively in different ways and perhaps re reaching different groups. If you're a business, you need a social networking site. If you don't set it up, someone else will do it and they may not like you. It's essential in any business today. On the company-owned social media site, you encourage your users to talk about your products and be able to provide feedback. You're generating a conversation between the company and the user, and the conversation becomes more personal as the organization learns more about you and is able to personalize so that we engage with each other. What I want as an organization is to go viral, but in a good way. I want people to talk about my product so much that I have to make more of it or charge more. You never know what will go viral, however, and sometimes people employ bots so that a particular article will get moved up in searches. Positive viral stories or videos provide significant publicity. Sometimes, however, the publicity isn't desired. For instance, Kennesaw State went viral as word spread about Raymond Taylor, teacher at Kennesaw State University, strips in front of class. There's obviously more to the story, but the shocking headlines show up for everyone to read. By the way, I can assure you that this will never happen in my class, online or in person. To summarize what happened, this professor was going through a challenging time, suffering several, several losses. He told the class to have no regrets and to live life to the fullest. He then took off all of his clothes. Of course, someone videotaped it, but it wasn't reported until a few days later. He was arrested for indecent exposure, and the last I heard, everyone agreed he had mental issues and they were looking for ways to get him the help he needed. More recently, in September 2017, a local high school teacher 
made the news after saying that two students wearing Make America Great Again shirts had to either turn the shirts inside out or leave her classroom. She said that the slogan was used by neo-Nazis and it was like the swastika. She also said that she wasn't comparing Trump to Nazis, but that some groups who use the slogan are Nazis. Of course, a student captured it on videotape and it went viral. The teacher was from River Ridge High School, which is where my husband teaches. The entire faculty staff got slammed with email messages over and over again. The administration advised employees to avoid social media and to take a break from email for a few days. The punishment for that teacher is in, uh, unknown since it's against Georgia law to share disciplinary actions taken against teachers. The principal and the county apologized to the students and the parents and said that it wasn't against school rules to wear the t-shirt. We see the same issue over and over again. Don't assume that what you're doing is private or what you're saying will stay in a room or in an email message. There are many examples of positive viral marketing and that's obviously what your corporation wants. Before you are hired, however, do you believe that the organization checks your social media? Of course they do. It would be a major oversight not to check social media. You have to make sure that you don't reject an applicant because of any protected class, race, color, creed, national origin, disability status, etc. But belonging to a particular political party is not protected, nor is being skinny or overweight or pretty or not so pretty. If you happen to be an outspoken political activist, guess what? That's not protected either. So your employer in the state of Georgia could decide not to hire you because of your political party affiliation. Similarly, you can leave a company because of their political party affiliation or views that they have. In general, keep off of Facebook pictures of you drinking or doing drugs, legal or not, looking pr provocative or behaving inappropriately, making discriminatory remarks about any group, or any Title IX protected class or any group if the company has a different opinion than you do, or sharing confidential information. Think of what a company could learn about you from your posts. Ask Michael Phelps if anyone else at a party might post a picture of you smoking pot, for instance. If you're a public figure, you give up even more privacy. Businesses do have valid reasons to use and monitor social media and you should do so wisely. You want to allow customers to share good and bad experiences. You want to include all reviews as long as they meet the standards set by your terms and agreements. The best thing to do is to ask for help from those who know about social media design. Then make sure to monitor the organization's social media accounts regularly and make sure that all policies are being followed. There are a couple of not so good examples. DiGiorno Pizza noticed that hashtag why I stayed was trending. Without investigating much further, they decided to join the fun. They wrote hashtag why I stayed, you had pizza. That's clever, isn't it? And it makes you smile. What if instead you knew that hashtag why I stayed was in use for domestic violence and was asking people to post why they stayed in an abusive relationship or how they got out of it? Now how do you feel about DiGiorno's posting? The posting would be fine, but not in the context given. The second example is from Delta, who posted about the match between the USA and Ghana. They congratulated Team USA and Ghana on a great game. They put an iconic picture of the Statue of Liberty for the U.S. and an iconic picture of a giraffe for Ghana. Hmm, anything wrong here? This is from Delta, who flies all over the world, so surely they know a little about Ghana. There are no giraffes in Ghana. The post made Delta look stupid. Know your customer and know what's being posted by authorized users. This is one of my favorites, the Target Troll in 2015. Around that time, Target announced that they would no longer have pink and blue sections, but would have a simple toy section instead. 
Some people were mad about it and took to Facebook to make their opinions known by posting comments. Ask for help with a Target lo logo for the profile picture responded to some of the postings. Let's take a look at just a few examples. The comment said, FYI, we will be purchasing our bike equipment from Walmart because we think removing boys-girls distinctions is unnecessary and makes a statement we do not agree with. Target responded, we're sorry to hear that. Good luck with your new relationship with Walmart. Be careful, we hear, we hear they sell bikes without the seats on them. The user responded, wow, nice customer service. Then Eddie and... Candy Walka said, I want to say that I'm totally against Target doing away with gender-based bedding, etc. for children. We will no longer be shopping at your store. Target responded, and we at Target just want to say that we are totally against couples having one Facebook account. It is ridiculous and just wrong. We will now be adding you to the cannot shop here list. The next said, and I used to love shopping at Target. Bye-bye. Target responded, don't let the door hit you where the good Lord split you. And the user said, wow, really? The next user wrote, I know this means little to Target. And Target responded, actually, you're wrong. It means nothing to us that you feel that way. This was a hilarious example of a troll who fooled customers and the organization. The thing is, he was able to be a Target troll for 13 hours. Nobody from Target noticed until then. Target's response was excellent. They said the trolls were back at Target. That's the way you respond to a breach. Social shopping sites have changed how we buy products. Traditional retailers are feeling the pinch. Walmart, for instance, now offers online grocery ordering and you drive up and they load your car. I tried it and it worked great. My husband never even had to get out of the car. Amazon is a social shopping site that everyone aspires to be. They started with just books and ran almost every other bookseller out of business. Barnes & Noble took to the online marketplace but also tried to offer book clubs and discussions to keep people at their stores. They've managed to stay alive for now. And most stores will match Amazon's prices as long as it's truly fulfilled by Amazon. On this, these sites, shoppers and sellers share information and make recommendations. eBay tells you how satisfied customers are with a retailer. All of these sites try to help the customer buy more by making recommendations. Customer who bought this item also bought dot, dot, dot and they make it easy to check out more quickly with their app than with another. If you leave something in a shopping car, they helpfully remind you. Some of your more traditional retailers, like Macy's, have moved to omni-channel options to reach their customers. They want you to log in when you get to the store, and they'll give you coupons and direct you where to find products. Or you order at home and pick up in-store, and sometimes receive a discount. Sellers want to reach you on your phones, your laptops, your tablets, your desktop, whatever. They want to use all channels available to them, and they should do this. Revenue is then generated online through targeted advertising with retail partners that you may have indicated some interest in. They may also share seller ratings and allow customers to leave reviews about their experience. From the comments, retailers may make design improvements and or get, out, get ideas for new product lines. I've seen a product in the past with a low score and people talking about something that's wrong. The book needs editing, parts are missing, shipping was slow. And sometimes sellers will put in their descriptions that this is an updated product that's been edited or that we've made sure all parts are included or we ship quickly now. If they don't respond, we as sellers or as buyers may go elsewhere. To summarize, social media presents multiple opportunities to advertise, advertise products and to target customers with a high probability of being interested in what you sell. Social networks are a face for your products 
and they need to be monitored and updated. If you want a job, it's a good bet that a company will look at your social media profiles. Plan accordingly. Your customers are going to look at social media to voice their likes and dislikes. You want to make sure that your organization plans appropriate responses and doesn't get trolled like Target did. 